This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is sponsored by The Fire Store. Learn more about getting the gear you need at prices you can afford by visiting thefirestore.com. Welcome, everybody, to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzel. I'll be your host. I'm a writer here at uh, Fire Rescue One. I've been writing with uh, the commander now for 12 years plus. We've been doing this podcast now for almost a year plus. And uh, Janelle, of course, as, uh, as I'm talking about, Janelle Fasquette, the commander, my partner in crime in this. How are you doing today, Janelle? I'm doing great. How are you, Sam? Well, I'm overly excited because we have a fire service unicorn with us. We have somebody who's got <laughs> expertise in two uh, and, and a lot of expertise in two kind of, uh, you know, not only the fire service, but also in law. So most people will already know who I'm talking about here. It's Kurt Barone. Uh, how you doing, Kurt? Thanks for being here. I I'm good. I'm good. I, I got to spring a little surprise on you, though. There's actually a third area that I'm venturing into. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in a graduate program at Arizona State University in forensic psychology. Wow. Um, yeah, which, yeah, so which is, is, is actually putting together a lot of the things that I've been working on, both in the law and then leadership wise from the fire service, because a lot of it comes down to psychology. So, but yeah, there's a, there's a third, uh, there's a third monkey in the middle here. Oh my goodness. We're, is that like getting by, into why people make the mistakes that they make? Yeah. Why? And then when we understand why, then hopefully we're going to come up with better solutions uh, to some of the problems that we're facing. Yeah. So when is that going to be completed? Um, oh, I don't know. Over the next 10 years. It depends on how far I go. It, <laughs> okay. I, honestly, it depends. I, I My plan is not to get a PhD. Um, my plan is to do research. I, I want to do research in this and certainly advance my study. So whether I, I stop at a master's or go on, I'm, I'm, I'm up in the air right now. So, but I, the point is it's a new area that connects two of the areas that I've been focused on for the last 15 years or so. Well, and it's all, it's really the essence of, of, uh, our program is trying to get better, trying to continually educate. And here you are, you're an attorney, you're a firefighter. Mm -hmm. You have decades of experience um, as a practicing attorney licensed in, in Rhode Island and Maine. You've served as a career firefighter in Providence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you retired as a deputy assistant chief as well yeah. as a volunteer. You've been paid on call. Mm -hmm. You run the Fire Law blog. You have a couple of books. And here you are going back to school and, and working to improve yourself. So I'm excited it, just to talk to you and thank it you. It never again. ends. Yeah. You know, it's just education never ends. It, it's just, it's just what's next. Like, what else do I need to do to learn the next most important thing? Yeah. Well, let's even back up. How did you get started in, in law? I mean, the, you know, the fire service, <laughs> we can all kind of understand that a little bit, right? Cause yeah. where, where we come from, but you know, where did those passions come from? And then how did you get the idea to tie them together? You know, it, that that would take a, a long time to get through it all. But let me let me start with um, I became a volunteer and joined sort of the family business. My grandfather was the chief. My uncle's generation, my dad, and my uncles were officers. Now, my dad had already left the department. But, um, you know, you know, it was something that um, I, I recall my some of my earliest memories, three, four, five years old, was being at my grandfather's house. Uh, maybe for Thanksgiving or Christmas, and all of the adult men would get up and leave for a run, you know, and it was just that, that, and then, you know, someday when you turn 16, you'll be able to. And so that's how, you know, I came into the fire service. Like I, I, I get a kick. Some people say, um, I always wanted to be a firefighter, you know, I, you know, that it was expected that I was going to be a firefighter, <laughs> you know, yeah. it was yeah. like, what's, what's wrong with you if you don't become a firefighter, that, that kind of thing. So, but um, my dad is an attorney. Uh, my uncle, I had a, a grand uncle, my, actually my grandmother's uh, brother, was on the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And so when my dad went into practice, he uh, had access to uh, Judge Paolino, uh, who's, again, he was on the Supreme Court. And uh, before we came on, you were, you were making note of all the books in the back there. Um, those are all the books that my, uh, my great uncle had that were given to my dad. And then now I, and certainly my dad bought more books. And then 
I ended up buying books when I started practicing. I started practicing in 1985 and there was no internet. Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. So, <laughs> so um, basically, we, you know, as an attorney, you'd have to buy books. And what what is behind me, I've got probably five times as, as many books as what you see behind me in my garage in boxes. <laughs> so I got my my great uncles, I got my dad's and I got my own that I purchased until um, some of the more sophisticated computer uh, research tools for lawyers have have really kind of put made books almost obsolete. Um, so that, you know, I kind of came through both the fire service and the law kind of naturally through uh, my family. Um, and I really, I, honestly, I, I really, it wasn't my plan when I went to college, it wasn't my plan to go in, into law. Um, I, I really, and I think that's helped me have sort of an objective opinion about the law because, um, like a lot of people, I was very skeptical about lawyers because my dad was a lawyer, but uh, very skeptical <laughs> um, about their intentions and their motives. And I shared a lot of the sort of common sentiment about the practice of law and greedy people and parasitic attorneys and, and that type of an approach. But shortly after getting on the Providence Fire Department, uh, I left the, the North Providence Fire Department, that, which was, you know, I, I probably could have stayed there and, and gone on to the career department. It was sort of a combination at the time I left, but I, I went with Providence. And um, shortly after getting on there, I realized uh, how intertwined uh, the fire service is with the law. And um, I, I, I found that um, Kind of, kind of accidentally, because I, I started going to meet with my dad at his office to ask him questions, or I call him on the phone, and, and you know, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that, and more and more that connection between uh, what we do as firefighters and the law um, drew me to the conclusion that you know maybe maybe I ought to consider law school. It was something I never really thought about, you know, and so then I decided to, you know, go forward with that. And uh, once I started studying it, I really, I fell in love, just like I'm in love with the fire service, I, I fell in love with the law. And really now I'm in the niche between uh, those two. Okay, so Kurt, you mentioned that you started to see kind of, there's some congruencies between fire and law. Oh yeah. And, and, and you know, I'm a truck guy and I, and I oh, try I'm, to- I'm if, so sorry. I'll, yeah, I'll, right. Well, so, well, hope if I speak slower, it, it would. And then, of course, so you know what my next question is. Okay, I don't see those those correlations. So give me a couple that you, that, you know, that you really started to see and go, okay, there's here. Yeah. Here we go. Here's these congruency. I did use the word congruency, though. I thought yeah, that's, that was pretty that, that's impressive. That's not a trucky term. <laughs> That's uh, that's that's an engine company officer term. So, but at, at any rate, and I'm an old engine guy, so I'm going to give you the business, just like I, you know, just like I would in the firehouse. But yeah, um, the um, the differences or the uh, the um, areas of of uh, dispute that led me to talk to my dad often involved uh, collective bargaining, uh, involved contracts, um, involved grievances, involved civil service. Uh, involved um, things like searches of lockers. Um, can the city come in and search a locker? Can the city look in somebody's uh, briefcase or backpack? Um, can and and ethics laws is another another big area of concern uh, in terms of what can a firefighter do, what can't a firefighter do? What's the significance of the fact that you work for government um, and uh, public records? Uh, and uh, free free speech is another big area. I remember having a number of conversations with my dad because firefighters were getting in trouble for posting things or not posting things, but saying things or speaking to the media. Uh, it's back before uh, before we really had uh, some of the social media challenges. But you know, folks were getting themselves in trouble. We had a uh, a union president that got in trouble for putting a bumper sticker on the mayor's limousine at a protest, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's an IFF bumper sticker on the mayor's limousine. And they, they, you know, they they wanted to charge them with vandalism, va uh, you know, vandalizing. So, um, but uh, there, there was a lot, and then of course arson and arson investigations and and those types of connections. So, um, you know, to me, it was just full of of intersection between fire and law. Yeah. Now, now that I kind of I, I I get get your angle, and now when you start to look at, it, you're like, okay, yeah, 
there's that you didn't even mention the liability side of things right oh, yeah. and then there's yeah, yeah and um mm -hmm. and then there's the hiring side so mm -hmm. there is a ton of correlation there and and you've written a couple books mm -hmm. uh, probably highlighting those things and, and you i think your first one you wrote were in what it was in 20 2006 mm -hmm. and that's uh, legal considerations for fire and emergency services and fire officers legal handbook and now you're in, I think, this third edition of those. I mean, how are fourth edition, fourth edition fourth. of legal considerations? We didn't move forward with um, fire officers legal handbook. That's still in its its first edition. And my uh, original idea was to use legal considerations as sort of a, a textbook for um, folks who are in a college level program in fire law, fire service, legal issues. Okay. So that's, that was going to be a textbook. Fire officers, legal handbook was going to be more of a desk reference uh, for fire chiefs. And um, what we opted to do, because there's so much work involved in producing both of them. And um, what we opted to do, I, I kind of convinced the uh, the publisher was rather than go into, or we we convinced each other, I guess you could say, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we decided yeah. to go uh, go with one uh, but was going to be expanded and there'd be a lot of appendix information. Uh, but I think the book, I, I got a copy of it over there. It's, it's probably about 500, 600 pages right now. Uh, whereas uh, I think for the community college type of uh, fire law program, probably you only need 300, 250 or so. But uh, we want to provide that additional information for fire chiefs uh, and fire service leaders, union presidents and so on. Uh, so that they have the the information that they need to, to really be able to understand the issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. give them enough reference and and then background as as much as they'd like. How much has that changed over the last couple of years? I mean, you started in two thousand six seven. Now sure. you're you know almost uh, you know fifteen years later. How has that changed? It, it, it has quite a bit. Um, and you know we keep trying to uh, you know stay stay ahead of the uh, issues and stay current with the issues, but. Uh, some of the more uh, pressing issues that have developed in that interim was, was social media, mm. um, digital imagery and picture taking. So, you know, back in uh, the late 90s, we really didn't have firefighters getting themselves in trouble taking pictures and sharing pictures. And that that really started in the early 2000s, um, 2006, 2007. We started to see some problems, but then by 2010, um, you know, we were losing, I think we were losing more firefighters to social media than any other disciplinary um, reason. It, it was just, um, you know, an explosion of cases. And it, it, you know, from from my perspective, a lot of my clients are fire chiefs and, and fire departments. And I see how when these scandals break, they derail where the chief is trying to take the organization. And, um, the chief's ability to go to the city council uh, or go to the fire district board, whatever, you know, whatever the leadership is to, to go to the board and to try to get funding, proper funding um, and and bring the fire service issues forward to the community is harmed because of the resulting scandal that is sort of in the aftermath of whatever a firefighter posted on social media or the pictures. And it makes it that much more difficult to move the organization forward. So it has um, impact beyond just, you know, a funny headline and, uh, you know, we all sit in the station and say, well, look at the, look at what this idiot did. Uh, but there's, there's impacts um, that cost firefighters money. Talk, you know, if the money isn't there, it's not there to buy new trucks. It's not there to buy new equipment. It's not there for pay raises, <laughs> you right. know, so that, that's a problem. I mean, what's that's that's a, a very good point because that's one thing I think we all have to understand is, uh, you know, how the organization can quickly um, be deemed as, uh, you know, kind of under the context of of, of one particular notion from one individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are some other things that you wish, as you're going through cases, you just wish, you know, let's say you, me, me as a truck guy or me as a fire lieutenant, what what's the, what are a couple of things you wish we would understand? You know, uh, and and especially through your journey as as both the fire side and the law side, you know, mm -hmm. you know, they, they seem obvious for you right now. How do you make it obvious to me? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different layers of uh, issues, uh, a patchwork of issues. Um, one of the uh, biggest things that I think um, 
we struggle with is understanding what is our biggest liability. And uh, from a, from the fire department's perspective, think think that if we did not know what was the most likely type of response we were going to have, if we we had no idea what like what's the most likely reason we're going to get called out? Is it for a false alarm? Is it for a trench rescue? Is it for a hazmat incident? If we weren't sure, then how do we prepare? Um, and if all we think about is fires. And we're, we're like, we have a lot of very dedicated people that all they focus on is fires, but they're oblivious to the fact that most of our emergencies are not fires. Maybe they're EMS runs or maybe they're hazmat incidents or whatever. Then we're going to be putting resources into an area that isn't our biggest area of concern and kind of taking that approach to liability. Um, I don't think we've had a good sense for what is our biggest liability. And just like you, I have to go to refresher training, EMS refresher, CPR every two years, like we get some sort of uh, dementia so that we have to, we have to, you know, (laughs) keep going back over the same thing for 50 years. But, um, but bottom line is um, we can get, derailed uh, and and go off in, in a direction um, based on what an instructor in a program like that is going to tell us. And they're going to say, well, you know, our biggest liability is not getting refusals from people before we leave the scene on a medical run. That's our biggest liability. And so you walk away from that saying, oh, that's our biggest liability. By the way, let me make it clear. That is not our biggest liability. Yeah, right. And I, I hope I don't offend any of the folks out there in uh, in the EMS world. Uh, but that is not our biggest liability, not by a landslide. We're talking about less than 1%, okay, uh, of our, our biggest liability. Um, some people say, oh, our biggest liability is not getting to Mrs. Smith's house fast enough. That w- if, we, if we can't get there within the NFPA required timeframes, that's our biggest liability, okay? Is it a liability? Absolutely. Are refusals against medical advice a liability? Absolutely. Is it our biggest liability? It, it it turns out it's not, and uh, I know I know Janelle knows this, uh, Aaron. I don't know if you know it, but um, I have a database of lawsuits. Yes, um, yep. and fire law blog. You can read a lot of them. Yep. Right, but I have them in a database, not just in not just on the blog. Okay, I've got thirteen right now. Um, last night I put in twelve thousand nine hundred ninety five and ninety six, so I'm like four short of thirteen thousand cases in the in the database and uh, I joke some people collect stamps <laughs> I collect lawsuits <laughs> okay <laughs> but um I, and I, I think I'm I'm basically a scientist at heart I think that's that's the bottom line and I want data I don't want speculation I don't want it based on somebody's anecdotal experience I want it based on data and nobody had this data and so I started building this uh, database roughly, 15 years ago. Um, And uh, so what that allows me to do is look at what is our biggest liability? How is a fire department most likely to be sued? Who is most likely to sue the fire department? Okay. Is it going to be Mrs. Smith because she's upset that we didn't get to Mr. Smith's uh, heart attack fast enough? Uh, Or we we brought in uh, the oxygen cylinder when we should have brought in uh, a suction uh, or whatever, whatever mistake that they're going to allege. Is that our biggest liability? Are we not getting to Mrs. Smith's house fast enough uh, when she's got a house fire? Uh, and it turns out it's not. It, that's not our biggest liability. Is it a liability? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it our biggest liability? No. Our, our, biggest, li- our biggest liability is sitting in the firehouse with us. It's a firefighter suing the fire department as well as their colleagues. And you would ask from a lieutenant's perspective, um, you know, what what are some of the liability concerns? The firefighters in your station are the ones most likely to file suit against you. It's not Mrs. Smith. Okay. Um, and we've got to we've got to kind of come to grips with that because it has implications for how we train our officers. Um, and if we don't train our officers in how they're supposed to handle a trench rescue, we can't expect them to be able to competently handle a trench rescue incident. Maybe a little sort of inadvertently do it right. Uh, but if we haven't trained them, we can't expect that if we haven't given them the right equipment as well. Okay. So when it comes to you as an officer managing your liability, um, have you been trained? 
Have you been trained in how to deal with a difficult employee? Uh, have you been trained to deal with what happens when a firefighter uses the N-word in the fire station uh, or tells uh, maybe an inappropriate uh, joke uh, in the fire station? Uh, or a firefighter comes to you and is saying, hey, you know, some, so-and-so just told the joke and I don't feel comfortable with that. And you as my officer now need to do something about it. If we're not competent in that, you know, we're going to have problems. Would you say it's more um, peer to peer issues or more peer to supervisor as the problem, the, the lack of supervision mm -hmm. or training? That's really what I want to research further. OK, I, I my sense is that people are getting themselves in trouble um, and a lot of it's brought on by themselves. Uh, and then they're going to look for a convenient excuse for why it's not them, why it's my officer or why it's my colleagues or why it's the chief or why it's the union or why it's the guys on the other shift, anybody but them. And that's really what I want to research, um, you know, depending on, uh, you know, how much fuel I have left in my tank of life. But I, I really want to explore that issue because the suits, it's very clear, the suits are coming from inside the firehouse. It's not, it's not that we're not being sued from outside the department, but about 60, between 60, depending on what you look at, 60 to 70% of our liability is coming from uh, HR types of, uh, you know, actions. Uh, somewhere around 25% of our liability is coming from incident-related suits. And some of the incidents are actually brought by firefighters as well. Uh, but uh, an awful lot of it is HR related. And, um, you know, as I read some of the cases, I, I'm just the, 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 the sort of the curious scientist in me is, is wondering um, how much of the problem was really the victim and the way the victim behaved versus how much of it was the perpetrator in the scenario. Okay. And maybe, maybe both of them are, are difficult employees. Okay. And, and everybody else is just standing back going, Oh my God, I can't believe these two people can't get along. Okay. So again, that's really one of the areas that I want to research and, and, and just try to pin down just how much of our, um, our HR problems are the fu a function of a uh, dysfunctional people. Um, and how much of it is really the department mishandling things. So it's very difficult. If you have a difficult employee, um, and, and you, you probably know the same thing, you, you know, you probably start to put names to some of these folks. Um, but we have officers that will get a transfer to get away from a difficult employee instead of trying to deal with the problems that that employee is creating. So, yeah. and, then, and then sometimes you have a, an employee who is actually creating problems for other people. They're, they're bullies or they're, yeah. you know, they're engaged in difficult, uh, you know, uh, difficult interpersonal interactions. So well, we can thinking of uh, like horror film, like the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> yeah. The lawsuit is coming from <laughs> that's a great, inside the that's house. That's a great analogy. I think we can all like, wait, yeah. they're in the closet? Yeah. What? No, they're in the bathroom. They're where? They're, they are everywhere. They're you in know. the bunk room. They're, they're in yeah. the bunk room. Yeah. yeah. They're in the truck. They're out, you know, they're in the bay. As yeah. far as like uh, when you look at, you're saying, um, you know, what are our most prominent issues are, mm -hmm. is that, cost and is that also like occurrence well I'm, I'm looking at frequency of um of lawsuits that's primarily what i'm looking at it's beyond frequency of lawsuits it gets very difficult to use other objective factors because there's reasons why a legitimate lawsuit someone who has been legitimately harmed walks away with a, with no recovery OK, there are okay. reasons why that happens. There's liability, um, there's immunity from liability. Um, there are strategic mistakes that are made uh, in terms of bringing a lawsuit. Um, there's a lot of reasons why someone with a meritorious suit will lose. So if we just look at dollar amounts, that's that's not a good barometer, right. I, I, I don't think. Sure. Um, there's also reasons why someone with a non-meritorious uh, claim uh, may get a recovery. 
okay, including just the, you know, the nuisance value of, you know, getting rid of uh, this particular cause of action. So um, I, I tend not to put a lot of weight. We can look at those. I do track those to the extent that I, I can. I do track those. Uh, but I don't think the data is as strong as the, the lawsuit. So filing of the lawsuit is a pretty objective measure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, there's consistency there that you can categorize, you know, mm -hmm. to, to give you more um, usable data also. Sure. Um, you know, and, and as, you, as we started to talk about this, I can't help but think, you know, one of the themes that we've heard through the past year talking with, you know, members of the fire service is there seems to be a real need and a want for leadership training. And it mm -hmm. seems like that seems to be part of your theme too, is saying, you know, we can train people about fires. We can train them how to put out fires and pull hose lines, but where we're still having this gap is it, on the soft skills is kind of what we just had um, chief Lieb on. And he, he was talking about developing those soft skills. Um, and, and is that kind of correlating to what you're seeing? Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I've met Chief Lee, but I'm not sure what exactly he's talking about. Uh, but um, but yeah, we need to get our officers to the point where they can recognize a problem employee. And this is, um, I, I'll, I'll kind of run through a little bit of what I talk about in my toxic employee program. But um, imagine if we have two houses, okay, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones. And Mrs. Smith's house uh, is built like a um, burn building. Okay, it's concrete walls, concrete floors, concrete roof. It's a burn building, okay? Uh, Mrs. Jones lives in a lightweight wood truss building, okay? We owe a duty to both of them. We can't say we're not gonna respond to Mrs. Jones's house because it's too dangerous. Uh, but we, we have, two risk parameters associated with each of those two buildings. And we've got to respond, but we know with Mrs. Smith's house, the fire resistive house, we can stay inside and fight it a little bit longer. Okay. But Mrs. Jones's house, lightweight wood trust, once it's in the structure, if it's room and contents, we can handle it in the structure. We could be very careful of a collapse. Okay. What if there are people who are the same thing? Okay. That people are the, the human equivalent of a lightweight wood trust building. And we don't train our officers to be able to recognize that. What could result? What sort of problems could result? Well, we know at a building fire, somebody could get killed if we don't recognize that we've got a lightweight wood trust building. Uh, you know, if, if we don't recognize that Mrs. Jones's house is a lightweight wood trust building, somebody could get killed. And we have to build our size up, our SOPs, our training around Mrs. Jones's house, the lightweight wood truss building. If we go to a fire like that and it turns out that it's actually a fire resistant building, well, you know what? No harm, no foul. We're a lot safer. It's good we took the precautions, but we're, we're probably okay. And I think when it comes to people, what we you know, we, we typically do is we assume we're dealing with Mrs. Smith. We assume that we're dealing with the uh, normal, well-adjusted um, person. And we apply the same things that we can apply to a normal, well-adjusted person. But when we're dealing with the lightweight wood trust version, uh, things don't go that way. So we, my point here is that we've got to get our officers to the point where they can recognize the personality profile of these people. And we've got to make sure that you're not, you're not gonna you're not gonna there's no medication for these folks, okay? But there are some techniques that we can use to minimize the harm that could potentially result from these folks. And uh, there's so many so many so many intersections here that that we could we could talk about. But um, one of the other ways that really kind of brought the importance of this out. Um, was I think it was about seven or eight years ago, I started using Lexus, which is a computerized um, electronic platform that it's connected to somewhere around 80% of all the courts in the country. And when I read a, an article about a firefighter from whatever town uh, filing a lawsuit, I'd see their name in the newspaper, whatever. I'd put their name into the Lexus database to find the lawsuit that they just filed. And 
certainly I would find the lawsuit that they just filed. And I'd find about 10 others that they filed. Mm -hmm. Maybe they used to work for UPS. Maybe they used to work for Coca-Cola. Maybe they're suing their neighbor. Maybe they're suing, you know, uh, a municipality that they used to work for. And I'm like, holy cow. Okay. And that happens once. Okay, fine. Happens once. Happens again. Happens again. Happens again. <laughs> and I actually have a new category in my database for frequent litigators. Okay. And an awful lot of our litigation is coming from a very small group of people who, again, are that equivalent of that lightweight wood trust building. Hmm. And we've got to train our officers, number one, to recognize it. Um, also, the things that cause this person to file lawsuits and grievances. And by the way, the unions, the unions are got to deal with these people as well. And they're difficult to deal with. And they drive the, the union officials crazy because they're they're constantly having to get involved in problems that these people create. So this is not a city versus the union type of an argument here. This is really, you know, we got to try to get to the, the root cause of this. I'm um, seeing the uh, forensic psychology connection here. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, see, I think we've all known somebody who could be described as having, you know, conflict seeking behavior, yeah. you know, and how does that you know, you connect the dots to, to folks who are filing lawsuits, essentially. Yeah. And and the other side of this is it's not their fault. Um, we're getting to the point where we understand uh, the, the science, some of the medical science that's around this. And it's primarily, uh, you know, somewhere in the 80 percent range of being genetic. Uh, so they didn't choose to be this way uh, and they're not aware that they're being this way. They think the problem is everyone else. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but these are the folks that are these are the folks that are filing um, most of these lawsuits. Now, um, some of the folks that are filing the lawsuits are actually the victims of these people. So you have you have this type of person that's in the workplace and they're creating problems. And now they victimize someone who really is just a pure victim. They're a pure victim of of someone like that. Uh, and so then you have lawsuits by by the victims. And then inevitably, the folks that are engaged in this um, create um, disharmony in the workplace. They 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 people are mad that mm -hmm. people are not happy with them. And uh, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the firehouse um, take things and take matters into their own hands and start trying to deal with it through peer pressure. And then that in turn looks like harassment. So now it looks like that person's being harassed. And the next thing you know, we get a harassment complaint and they're blaming them and they're blaming them and they're blaming them. And, you know, uh, the whole world's against me. And, uh, you know, in reality, at, at, the, at the heart of it, we've got, um, you know, we have a, a mental disorder. You know, it's prob probably not significant enough to require treatment, uh, but at, at the heart of it, we've got somebody that uh, really, really could do, you know, they could benefit from from some therapy that not firefighter therapy, but <laughs> right. re real, real therapy. You know, like uh, when I was a young firefighter, they, they still used to give people blanket parties, you know. And uh, so, you know, th those those don't happen, hopefully anymore. No, no. Well, they, I'm sure they still do every once in a while. You just don't hear about them un until it yeah. goes wrong, of course, right. is what you're talking about. And, yeah, and they and call you. Yeah. And we certainly don't want to dismiss like true victims here. There are obviously tons of legitimate lawsuits by people who have been discriminated against, harassed, hazed, you know, and they are not the root. Absolutely. Um, and and, and they are but being truly victims. When we have those true victims, my my guess, and this is an anecdotal guess based on what I've been doing, is my guess is there's a disordered person that's perpetrating the harassment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so we're we're back to identifying that person who is the human equivalent of a lightweight wood trust building. Yeah. Because yeah. they, whether whether they're the ones that are suing, claiming they're the victims, or whether or not they're attacking or uh, harassing others, and the victims are the ones that are suing, at the center of it is we have a disordered person. Mm -hmm. Is there something administration can do to you know? Is that are we talking about hiring practices? Are we talking about 
Um, you know, and I, I'm sure in a lot of organizations, administration is very well aware of of these individuals, and they're when they're not acting on anything that mm-hmm. trickles down to possibly the field, and then we're opening the door. Correct? Yeah, I I don't think. Um, we're going to be able to do much when it comes to hiring. Um, we've got civil service systems. If somebody tests out in a certain way, uh, they're going to get the job. Um, many of the folks are, are not, uh, they're not clinically diagnosable, um, whether you call it subclinical or, or just a, a personality tendency, but they don't have necessarily the, um, you know, the, the impairments that would qualify them to be excluded. And it could, you could also get yourself into a disability discrimination mm-hmm. situation. So the, the numbers that we're talking about are roughly one in 10, roughly one in 10, uh, you know, people uh, are going to fall into this category. And um, I think we've got to train our officers uh, up on this. We've got to make sure that we have a good system in place uh, mm-hmm. to deal with the problems, the inevitable problems that are going to, uh, occur in, in the workplace. Uh, very often these people are, they're not well liked. Uh, and a- occasionally I could tell some of them are very well liked. So, but, um, but they create a lot of um, uh, problems in, in the workplace. And that's going to be a consistent theme uh, throughout their career. And uh, we've got to recognize them. And, um, you know, I mean, it'd be nice if you could just say, "Here, take this pill, and and you'll be you'll feel <laughs> yeah. better." There, there isn't there isn't a pill for it. It's not yeah. it's not a it's not a chemical imbalance or anything of, of that nature. Uh, but um, but we've got to recognize it, and uh, we've got to get any harassment that's directed at them to stop, and then we've got to get any harassment that they are the ones that are perpetrating it. Uh, we've got to get that harassment to stop. And so officers have really got to be like almost like a mediator. They've got to develop a skill set where they're going to be able to recognize the problem and then uh, mediate it and prevent it from getting further. And they're going to need support from above uh, as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. And and so let's talk a little bit about that. You know, mm-hmm. support from above, training. Mm-hmm. Um, it, what uh, What do you feel like, you know, as far as not only just this issue, but, you know, other parts of the fire service, what is one of the biggest things that we need to really start to focus on in the, in the next coming years in order to, you know, to minimize this litigation? I mean, you touched on, 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 you know, one certain aspect of it. I mean, but what else are we not doing or should we really be focusing on? Well, um, an, another area, it's a, it's a connected area, but I think it's a big uh, vulnerability and a weak spot that we've got is discipline. Um, we don't do discipline well. Uh, and I think it becomes very difficult when we're into one of these um, HR problems and we don't really have a good discipline system. And I don't, I don't mean uh, when I say a discipline system, I mean a punishment system, but I mean a system that is capable of uh, and and receptive to a complaint coming in and then having a full and fair investigation into it. And very often when we have a high performer, um, their complaints are, are treated one way when we have a low performer or and, and there's a lot of perception here as well. There's someone who's perceived as being a low performer, someone who's perceived as being a high performer. But um, the system responds differently. And in particular, when a low performer accuses a high performer uh, of misconduct, um, there's a tendency in the organization to rally behind the high performer and ignore the complaints of the low performer. So. Um, That's one of the areas that we've got to get better at dealing with discipline. We've got to kind of put punishment on the back burner. And and sometimes when we hear the word discipline, we we think of punishment. And um, we've got to we've got to kind of recognize that we've we've got some sort of misconceptions about what we're trying to accomplish when it comes to discipline. Discipline is about changing behavior. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't have to punish to get behavior to change, but we we have to get the behavior to change. Punishment is one way to do it. There's many other ways to do it as well. So we need sort of a sophisticated front office that's going to use a scalpel and not a sledgehammer uh, on these types of problems. But in many fire departments, unfortunately, discipline systems have become weaponized 
um, by the administration uh, in a heavy-handed way. And that that in and of itself is a problem uh, because then the administration, when one of the fair-haired boys does something, the administration they don't want to they don't want to take out the sledgehammer on one of the like, on one of their supporters. And so now we have some inconsistencies. There's a lot involved yeah. in that. We yeah. we could do an hour or so just on that. But well, and it, that it, goes back into culture. Then that leads into yeah. your culture and how sure. uh, how uh, the perception of leadership. I mean that yeah. that opens the door for so many other kind of uh, avenues. Yep. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision we make as a company is about you, our customer. We wouldn't be where we are today without you, and we don't take that lightly. We understand that having the right gear can mean the difference between life and death. Our goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit us at thefirestore.com for everything but the truck. And shop our family of brands, including Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more. Now let's get back to the show. But I, th- I think I think you're you're kind of you're kind of pushing me into a discussion on operations, which I love. I, I yes. absolutely love. And 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 so operationally, um, you know, we've we've got to kind of learn from our mistakes, and not necessarily just our mistakes, but mistakes across the country and maybe even globally when it comes to firefighting and you know so how how do we keep our department functioning at a at a a top operational level we've got to be aware of what's going on and what you know what are the lessons that are learned and the NIOSH firefighter fatality reports are phenomenal when it comes to that I mean and you read them and then you read one and then you read another and then you read another and then you read another and you see the same things it's like is anybody reading these things? <laughs> yeah. And so how do we take those lessons learned and get those, uh, you know, actually to translate into changes and in how we're conducting ourselves on the fire ground? Um, is there, is there a liability there when you start to see these patterns, but then, you mm-hmm. know, an administration just doesn't make any changes on, them. you know, I mean, you know, I, I get asked about liability like that all, all the time. Okay. And uh, they, you know, do you have any lawsuits where a fire department was sued for not getting to Mrs. Smith's house on time? Do you have any fire departments that were sued because of an accountability? Uh, You know, and but the assumption there is that you're going to be able to take an email from me or a lawsuit, throw it on the chief's desk and the chief is going to say, oh, my God, I didn't realize (laughs) I didn't realize that if we killed somebody, we could be held liable. I'm yeah. going to change the way I'm doing. That's that's. I don't know where that comes from, but that is not reality. That is not going to happen. the The chief doesn't believe it is a possibility. Okay, give you give you a really good example on this. One I like to use is just running a red light. Fire truck responding yeah. on a run, running a red light. Okay. Well, you have a, you have a firefighter that emails me and says, my chief won't require a mandatory stop at red lights. Do you have any lawsuits? Okay. That, that we could show him holding the fire department liable. Okay. Well, I don't think that's going to change the chiefs because in other words, he's saying, okay, so let me get this straight. Okay. The chief is okay with you running a red light, getting into an accident and killing somebody. The chief is okay with that. But if he could be held liable civilly, then he's going to change his mind. In other words, right? It's okay yeah. to kill somebody as long as I don't get held liable. Is that what you're telling me? That no, no, that's you know, that's that's it's it's kind of based on a flawed premise. Okay. Now, are there lawsuits? Absolutely. Hundreds of lawsuits of fire trucks running red lights, killing people, fire department liable. Hundreds of lawsuits, fire department runs a red light, kills people. The driver is held personally liable. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are also criminal charges. One recently in Kansas City. Another one I forget off the top of my head. It's in my blog, but uh, another one where um, the driver of the apparatus is charged criminally and ends up pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter or vehicular homicide or one of those other types of charges. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, so, but I don't think it's. I, I just think that they think that this is such a remote possibility of happening that there's no amount of convincing these folks uh, that 
you know, they need to change. I, I just, I just don't think slapping that down on the desk is, you know, they, they just don't think it's going to happen. And yeah. we're, we're waiting till the end of the chain for the bad outcome before <laughs> we're thinking about it. I mean, I work for Lexapol, yeah. so it's impossible yeah. for me to not think about policies and procedures. You know, if policies and procedures haven't been updated in 10 years, well, that's a pretty simple step you could take to try and prevent this final bad outcome. But there's there's many steps in the chain that could have cut it off at the path. My, my, my other profession is probably partly responsible for some of this. OK, because they don't teach us this kind of stuff in law school. OK, uh, they teach us to look at a policy. And, for example, where state law says that a fire truck can proceed through a red light with due care. OK, then an attorney is going to say, well, you don't want to tell them to stop at a red light. State law allows them to. If you tell them they got to, then they could be held liable if they get in an accident. So don't put that in there. That is crazy thinking. Only a lawyer would think like that. No, seriously, <laughs> right? seriously. Yeah. So, so because basically what you're saying is we want to encourage you to get in an accident because we have a good defense. And from a leadership perspective, what we've got to be saying is, look, we don't want to cause an accident. And the safest way for us not to cause an accident is to mandate the stop at the red light, period. Now the lawyers will, you know, push back on that, and that's a leadership function. And I don't know, I don't know where in the the leadership development we get this message out there, but from a leadership perspective, you've got to tell the lawyer, no, we're going to tell them they have to stop. Period. Okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna be worried about having a good defense if we kill a family of four in their minivan. I don't want a good defense. If we do that, we should be liable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But we want our firefighters to stop at red light so we don't have to deal with the lawsuit. Not, I don't want to win the lawsuit after seven years. I don't want to have the lawsuit. I don't want to kill anyone. Yeah. And that's also, by the way, the type of people that we need to have leading our organizations. Okay. Uh, people that, that really have a good understanding of that aspect. And uh, you know, we could do the same thing for accountability and, and all sorts of other types of uh liability creating events that could happen for a fire department. Yeah. But it goes down to taking that stand and saying, this is the way we're going to do it. This is what our policy is going to state. This is what our procedures are going to be. Right. And then trickling that through the organization and continually managing them. Correct. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but we've got enough sources of information. Okay. NIOSH is a tremendous source of valuable lessons learned. The NFPA standards are another source, okay? OSHA gives us some. We certainly should not be willy-nilly ignoring OSHA or ignoring NFPA. Uh, we really should be, to the greatest extent that we can, uh, building our SOPs to be compliant with both OSHA, NFPA, and NIOSH recommendations. Yeah, and and there's past, past practice on this too. And there's other mm -hmm. uh, you know organizations that have great policy already. So just sure. trying to utilize each other. Yeah. Um, on this. And so we, we talked a lot about some of the serious stuff. And of course the, the truck guy in me can't help, but ask what are, what are two things that you, you can recall, you know, just recently that you're like, are we seriously talking about this? Is this seriously in on my desk? I mean, you got to give us a little <laughs> juice on these. Well, I, you know, the, the, you can't make this stuff up cases. Um, th there's no shortage of them. They, they, they're just unbelievable. But, um, there is one thing that kind of relates, kind of, kind of maybe a little bit off here, but um, it it has well, it, it has to do with um, firefighters uh, and some of the some of the antics that they will engage in, um, causing HR people and city attorneys to try to um, eliminate fun in the firehouse. Okay. Uh, and I think some of the things I talked about with regards to the uh, lightweight wood trust employee, our, our toxic employee can get misunderstood because we have a rather uh, toxic environment in many of our firehouses or, and I don't, I don't think that they're toxic. Okay. But I think 
from the outside looking in, yeah. people would go, oh my God, they did that? Yeah, on paper, I, I, it doesn't look good sometimes, I, right? You know, like if right. you're just to write it out, it doesn't look but good. But it's, yeah. it's part of the dark humor that every fire department, I know firefighters from England, Germany. Uh, I met fire, believe it or not, when I worked for the NFPA for a couple of years, uh, after I left Providence, I worked for the NFPA and I got a chance to go to um, Interschutz, which is the largest fire service mm -hmm. uh, uh, event. And uh, so I met fire, I met firefighters from Iran, North Korea. Uh, it was it was unbelievable just, you know, but uh, we're all the same. And that that sense of dark humor permeates what we do. There were there are things that happen in a firehouse that you wouldn't bat an eyelash with at that. If you did that in a place like the NFPA or you did it and you're working for Coca-Cola, you'd be fired. You'd be <laughs> absolutely fired for doing that. OK, and I, I think that's something that attorneys and HR people struggle with. Because they they hear one of those crazy stories that happen, and they'll say, "Oh my God, we've got to fire that person. We got we can't have people doing that." And the chief is like, "Everybody does that. Like, yeah. you, you know, we, we we do that. Okay, but here's here's my point. My response to the folks from the outside that are going to be judgmental about the uh, fire service. Okay, one of the classes that I took uh, last year." Uh, was uh, a class on positive psychology. And positive psychology, most, most of psychology looks at uh, mental illness, trying to figure out what causes it uh, and what can we do to improve their functioning. Positive psychology looks more at what are healthy people doing and, and doing right and studying that. And then what can we do to kind of, in, you know, take those lessons Long story short, one of the therapies they taught us um, is, a, is a thing called humor therapy, okay? Humor therapy. Um, and you're not going to believe what it is particularly good at, particularly good at treating PTSD. I, I was just going to say, we've been okay. doing this for years in the fire service. And, yeah. and, and we have been self-medicating the fire service for centuries, not just in the United States, all over the world, has been self-medicating for centuries by by that kind of dark humor, okay? And for somebody to come in and say, you've got to clean up your act. And maybe you've heard people say, you've got to clean up their act. They, you know, we can't try to sanitize the fire service. Uh, I, I don't think that's the right direction. What we do need to do is recognize the people that are either causing a lot of the distress in the workplace or are claiming victim status, but it's really victim status that they've brought upon themselves. The, the high conflict personalities, whether you call them high conflict personalities, toxic personalities, whatever. And we get them the kind of leadership that they need to be successful or at least not to create as much of a problem as they might otherwise create. Okay. And I, I really think that that is, is one of the lessons that is, is coming into fruition. Now, what percentage of, um, victims are true victims versus what percentage are the high conflict personalities. That's what I want to research. I really want to get my arms around that. Uh, my anecdotal information uh, is is not going to be enough for me to fully, fully understand that. But I, that's one of the areas that I want to research. But I do want to just between you and I, between an engine guy and a ladder guy, um, we do not need to clean up our act uh, when it comes to this except when we're dealing with one of the high conflict people. Well, in one of your articles about hazing, I think you mm -hmm. summed it up very well. I'm just gonna read this. History has proven that well-intentioned fire service instructors do not necessarily know where the line is with regard to hazing and bullying. Yeah. You know, cause this is a very real problem. Mm -hmm. It's just identifying that line that can be so problematic because no one, I mean, we're not saying here to eliminate all fun, as we right. know, yeah. that's just not going to happen. And it can actually be really positive in some cases in terms of if you don't cross a certain line. Right. How but have you... we have we made those lines clear? And I guess that's mm -hmm. that's it. And and it is possible to do that. Now, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, but an organization can do that. An organization should do that. And if we've got a hundred officers, we've got a hundred company officers. Okay. Um, we're going to have a hundred different opinions about where that line is to be drawn. 
and so I think from an organizational perspective, it's possible to sit down and say, okay, here we go. The N word. We don't, we're not going to hear that in the station. I don't care if it's between two African Americans, two whites, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be used. Okay. And right on down the, the line, uh, to the, to the greatest extent that we can, but that is, that's leadership. That's leadership recognizing that we've got some uh, misunderstandings about boundaries uh, and we're going to make it clear. And we also, I, I feel very strongly that uh, many, many fire departments don't make it clear to their officer core where they have the discretion to handle something at their level and where they have to report it. And I think that's it's another area where, from the front office perspective, we want to make it clear. If these things happen, we expect you to handle it at your level. They happen the first time. But if they happen again, you've talked to firefighter A, you've told them not to do that, and it's happened again, you have to report it. Or we're going to hold you responsible. Mm -hmm. These other things, you have to report it the first time. If someone says, I feel like I'm being harassed, that has to be, you cannot sit on that. That has to be reported. Okay. So again, that's for the front office to work out that so that you don't have a hundred different opinions about how it's going to be done. Yeah. And you have to have a process in place because you got a hundred people drawing the line. Then you have 300 behind you trying to figure how far they can push it. Right. That's the fire service. And, we, and then you have to have things in place. What happens when they do? And I, and I think that's, that's exactly what you're, what you're saying, but you didn't give me, you got to give me some, a juice story here. One or two. You got any? I don't know. What do you want? A stripper walking out of a fire truck into a, a, a strip club? You well, know? that one's been done before. But, I mean, anything well, other than that. I mean, I, I, I joke. I have the easiest job in the United States. I don't have to make anything up. I mean, the, you know, like, so the things that have been done, I can't make stuff up. But that's, uh, you know, that that's one of the that's one of the ones that I find particularly troubling. Um, when I talk about it's probably 20 something years old, but the Sacramento porn star costume ball, the engine going over to the, uh, or a couple of trucks going over to an event at a local hotel called the porn star costume ball. I mean, what could possibly go wrong at that one? Um, you know, I mean, uh, according to my data and my data is skewed, no doubt, but, uh, because I, I tend to find out about the more sensational cases and I tend not to hear about the more mundane cases, but sexual misconduct is our right now our biggest disciplinary challenge in the fire service mm -hmm. um, porn videos being made in the firehouse yeah heard, live heard that one Rep, read yeah, that one yeah what about well, you know you you mentioned social media how, mm -hmm. how many is that still um you know very pressing issue you're getting calls on that every day as well you know i i think it's a reflection of uh what's going on in the world and um i i haven't seen anything um unusual in the last couple of years, certainly in the aftermath of the death of Michael Brown and then George Floyd, uh, we saw a, a great deal of um, disciplinary uh, actions coming down. And it's been fairly quiet, I'd say the last year or two. Uh, we still see some here and there, but for the most part, uh, I think things have improved on that point. Um, the uh, photo taking at the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash would be another one. There's somewhere around, of course, the, city, the county of Los Angeles, somewhere around $40 million um, to deal with the aftermath of that. So, Kurt, I'm wondering, are, you, are we seeing more First Amendment audit related cases or have those calmed down a little bit? They, they have calmed down. I don't know if they've calmed down or they're just not as... Um, in your face as they have been, but uh, they're certainly still out there. I was uh, doing a class uh, recently, and and that it, that very issue about First Amendment auditors came up. So they're they're still out there, but uh, I I just don't see the um, the problems being created to the to the same level that they were a few years ago. But it is something we've got to be prepared for. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we're getting a little bit better in some aspects of of you know, social media, legal, don't you know, say that. Legal don't, don't say I'm that. Jinxing. I'm jinxing. I'm trying to give you more business here. Don't well, say that. <laughs> and as I was thinking that I'm like, well, there's elections coming up. There's some, you know, there's some world, um, you know, hostilities and yeah. right. We have a tendency within, um, you know, the fire service to, uh, to, uh, want to make mention of those things on social media. So of course, uh, I caution people before they do that. Um, you know, same thing with, uh, leadership. I think, 
you know, even if you're you're not getting support or education from it. It's something that we can all benefit from, you know, even starting to read some books, um, obviously go to your, your fire law blog for more information. And I, I just can't think enough. We could talk for hours about so many different topics and, um, you know, you brought the show's IQ up tremendously. I appreciate that. And, you know, just your, 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 mindset on all this of, of how to integrate these two together and to make the fire service better. Uh, can't thank you enough for, for doing that and for being here, but you're not done yet. We have some questions for you <laughs> that, um, we like to put our guests and we like to put them in the hot seat. We try to dig a little more into, you know, the personal side of you and, and your own development and your own thoughts. And, uh, Janelle has, uh, some good ones today. So she, she's going to lead it off. Yeah, we've been have mercy, have mercy, Janelle. Have mercy. <laughs> Never. <laughs> we've been also focusing on our own positive psychology and uh with these questions, and we're we're taking them in a slightly different route to focus on really some of the good things that are happening in, in our guests' lives. So I would like to start off by knowing um, a recent moment of pride for you, something you were proud of recently. Um, my oldest son, uh, who um, was a firefighter. Uh, I guess technically he's still on our roster, but he was, um, you know, came up in my family. And uh, you know, so certainly this, this, uh, the red line, blue line that goes through my family right down the middle. Uh, and, but he became a firefighter uh, volunteer. And then he subsequently got on a career department. He worked for a couple of years on a career department uh, here in Rhode Island. And then he got into medical school. And um, he, I think originally wanted to be an ER doc. And um, I, I think for the same reasons that I kind of got frustrated, uh, you know, working on an EMS unit early in my career, I'm like, you know, there's just not enough sick people and too many people that really aren't all that sick. You know, if all we're doing is going on like serious trauma runs, I don't think anybody would be upset with that. But, you know, you're you're listening to somebody's tale of woe. In the meantime, there's a child choking a block away and you're, you're tied up at that run. So his, bottom line is um, he kind of felt like the same thing with uh, emergency medicine. So he became a trauma surgeon and uh, he just completed his fellowship uh, at um, shock trauma in Baltimore. Uh, and so he's now, um, you know, a fully, fully credentialed, um, you know, trauma surgeon, and he just just got hired within the last couple of weeks. He signed a contract. Uh, he's going to be uh, on the faculty. Also, he'll be a trauma surgeon, but also on the faculty at uh, Ohio State University's uh, medical center. So I'm heartbroken over that because I, I wish he would come back here to Rhode Island, but I'm proud of him. Very That's proud. That's great. That's wow. really wonderful. Yeah. Congrats. Congrats. Just the, the brain power at your holiday meals. I'd love to be a fly <laughs> on the wall listening to those. Well, we've got some law enforcement folks that tend to show up. Um, my brother, my son, uh, there's, there's one in every generation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. That, that well, my of, family that brings, law enforcement that brings the IQ down a little bit. So, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. But, yeah. You know. Law enforcement shows up on mine too. It's cause the neighbors <laughs> call cause we're playing too much music, but that's a whole nother podcast episode. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the biggest challenge that you've, you've overcome this year talking about, you know, more of the po positive side of, of life and positive psych psychology. Yeah. You know, I, I know you're one that challenges himself. And, and so mm -hmm. this year, what have you really um, overcome? Overcome. Well, you know, trying to work school um, into what I do has, has really been a challenge. And, uh, you know, I thought about I thought about giving up the uh, you know the Arizona State program. I'm halfway, a little over halfway now uh, through the through the uh, masters anyway. And uh, but I, I just felt like um, it's something that it, I need to connect the dots. I need to keep going. I need to keep learning more about it so I can connect the dots. Um, and I think once we get to the point, especially if I'm able to do that that research and and really kind of get to numbers where we can you know figure out uh, is it are are most of our lawsuits um, coming from someone who uh, has this personality? And it's what we're really talking about is a personality disorder. This ten personality disorders, six of them could be. Uh, 
subclassified as high conflict personalities. And is are these six um, resulting in most of our litigation, or is it really just a small percentage? You know, if it's just a small percentage, fine. Okay, but if it is, if most of our HR litigation is being driven uh, by these six, um, then uh, I, I think that we we now have a better understanding and we can move forward with it. And I, I want to get to the point where we can kind of definitively answer that question. So I've got to keep. I've got to I've got to stay with the program in order for me to get to that point. So that's that's my biggest challenge is trying to balance that with my law practice, with my obligations to my fire department, and um, you know, to certainly family and some of my uh, my other uh, passions. So and the dogs that you have to take care of on it. The do the know. dogs, fortunately, other than food and and having to be let in and let out, they pretty much take care of themselves. But. <laughs> Well, good for you for sticking with it. Uh, I would like to know who has been the biggest influence. In Alan Brunacini. Alan Brunacini. Without, yeah. I, I hope I didn't hesitate there, but um, <laughs> no. uh, I think he's had such an impact on on everybody. And you know, the the, the I kind of felt like he was um, special to me, and I kind of felt like I, I was special to him. And, and as I travel around the country, I meet more and more people. He had that ability to make all of us feel like we were special to him, you know, and that's a gift. Yeah. 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 And you all were, you know, that's the thing, it, yeah. you know, yeah, very special and talk about positive psychology, you know, be nice. What's, what's the biggest lesson you take from, from uh, Chief Brunacini? Well, he and I, uh, I, I love him and, and I, I think he loved me, um, but um, we disagreed on a lot of things and he was okay with that. You know, uh, s s where I come from sitting in a vehicle to be the incident commander. I mean, why don't you just stay in the station? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, really just, or, or drive to dispatch and, and run the incident from dispatch. I mean, give me a, give me a break. So he and I disagreed on that. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there was a few things. And when he actually came to Providence and I took him around and showed him, he goes, oh, my gosh. <laughs> he says, yeah, yeah, I can see why you, you know, really, because literally my vehicle might be parked two blocks from the building that's on fire. Just, you know, all the uh, all the other units that got there closer and narrow streets and all wooden buildings. And it's not not doesn't look like Phoenix, put it that way. You know? yeah. yeah. So, you know, there, there were things that we we would disagree about. But he would always listen and have a conversation. He would. And, 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 and um, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I just can't can't say enough about him. Yeah. I had the same, uh, just a, a great interaction with him. And I just felt like, oh, my gosh, like I just made a new friend. And he was very, uh, you know, inquisitive about what I was trying to do. And, and uh, you know, and then here you go talking with people like yourself, like everybody has that same story. And, and, uh, you know, I, I try to do that and, and maybe we're trying to do that through this podcast, uh, you know, I, these conversations, you know, he's such, such a special guy. I, I, I'll give you an example. I, I have a lot of different activities. Okay. But one of them, I have an apple orchard right over my, through that wall out in the back, through the know, books, 30 acres of beautiful, uh, country here uh, in Rhode Island. And, um, but uh, I've got my apple orchard and he knows that he, and he remembers that. And every time I'd have to, every time I'd see him, when I knew I was going to see him, I'd bring him an apple, you know, from the, he said, bring me an apple from the orchard. So I'd bring him an apple from the orchard, you know, but where, if I might bump into him in an airport, we'd be in Chicago going in different, Hey, you know, he said, Hey, you got an apple for me. I said, I, I didn't know I was going to see you today, you know? So, but whenever I would know I was going to see him somewhere, I'd bring him one of our apples. So. Well, taking all of your education, all of your knowledge, um, and and just all your experience together uh, comes to this final question is, how are you working to be better? I, I kind of think we kind of talked about it. I'm just, um, um, you know, kind of to some extent beating my head against the wall with these uh, graduate level classes, um, trying to cram additional information into my brain um, to kind of merge with all the other information that's already there from both my law and my fire service experience and then trying to mesh it and make it 
make it fit, make it all fit together in a coherent story. And it's a challenge, you know, it's mm-hmm. a challenge, but that's, that's what I want. And I, uh, hopefully, um, I'm actually involved with another researcher, uh, who's doing, uh, um, she's, she's looking at high conflict, uh, people that are involved in, um, the court system. And, um, uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to follow her methodology and in a couple of years and conduct the same research, uh, in the fire service. That's what I'm hoping anyway. We'll we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it works. Always trying to improve, always trying to learn. What's uh lastly, what's one bit of information you hope people take from this podcast to, to make themselves better? Um, well, ask questions. And and you know, one of the again, the big the big question um I uh think that we don't ask is what is our biggest liability? And if we don't know what that is, then we're kind of um at the mercy of whatever issue is vying for our attention. And there could be somebody in the organization that thinks like, for example, if we kind of use the metaphor of an emergency, like what's our, what's our biggest, you know, what's our most likely type of run. And we have somebody, you know, and I'm sure you know them has maniacs that they, Mm -hmm. they love hazmat. They love hazmat. If they've got a voice in the front office, then all of our resources are at risk of being devoted to hazmat when that's not our biggest liability and from a li- or not, not our biggest, uh, most likely incident. And what we want to have is a good understanding of what's our biggest liability and then make sure that we devote enough resources to that so that we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And right now, one of our, I think our biggest liability is our HR problems. Uh, and that we've got to get our front office staff, but also all of our officers trained up to the point where uh, we can effectively deal with that, recognize that this is our, you know, we're much more likely to be sued. The fire department, my data says the fire department is six times more likely to be sued by one of its own firefighters than by Mrs. Smith Mm. at six times. So um, we need to be devoting an appropriate level of resources uh, to that problem. And dedicating education, training, uh, mm-hmm. and and not you know turning away from uh, the staggering issues that we have here within yep. the fire service. Um, so well said. Thank you again for all of your knowledge. Thanks for uh, your time and uh, the stories. We could go on for hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you uh, are watching this on our YouTube channel, thank you. If you want to just listen to it, you can um, please subscribe to the podcast. You can go to the the Better Every Shift icon uh, at FireRescue1.com. You can email us at Better Every Shift at FireRescue1.com. Please rate, review the show wherever you are. If you get a chance, tell someone else about it. Uh, talk about what we're talking about. Hopefully, this spurs on conversations to continually ask questions. How can we get better as an organization? Where are our liabilities? As Kurt Verone so um, eloquently shared with us. But most importantly, everybody, make sure you learn something, do something, and share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening.